All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, today we've got two bills on the House floor, two budget bills, uh, our jobs bill uh, and also our state government finance bill. I'll let the chairs uh, introduce those bills and then we'll take some questions. So first we'll start with uh, Chair Pat Garofalo with the jobs bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we're really excited to bring forward the Job Growth Energy Affordability Policy and Finance Committee bill. Uh, in this bill are close to a billion dollars of private sector infrastructure projects that are going to be coming online in Minnesota with this legislation. A couple of exciting ones, first of all, in Invergrove Heights. Right now, we take a lot of our trash and we put it into landfills. There's a new project that's uh, cited to take place in Invergrove Heights where we're actually going to use the wastewater from the Empire Sewage Plant to help convert waste to energy. And so it's uh, in Minnesota law right now, we, put, we have preference to that, making sure that we're able to create energy or have zero uh, pollution as opposed to resulting in landfill space. So we're excited about that. In addition, an ex a, a large expansion of DigiKey in northeastern or northwestern Minnesota, up in the Three River Falls area, where a huge economic driver for northwestern Minnesota is gonna stay online. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have some, uh, some exciting projects that are taking place, both in the area of agriculture, uh, reinvestment, and infrastructure that I think are stuff that Minnesota can really be proud of. And Minnesotans, our competitive advantage has always been that it's not about bigger government, but it's about better government. It's not about dumb government, but small or smarter government. And I think this is an example of that bill. Uh, in the area of energy policy, our focus has been very simple from the beginning. That's cleaner and cheaper. And so in the past, there has been a, a false trade-off offered to Minnesotans that says that if you want cleaner energy, you have to pay more money. Or if you want to have affordability, then you have to pollute more. And with the breakthroughs in technology and the changes that we're making through and making in public policy in this bill, Minnesotans can be confident that you're going to have cleaner and cheaper energy going forward. Uh, beyond that, we make some needed changes in the area of workforce housing. In greater Minnesota, there's a huge problem where the jobs exist. People want, uh, they want to hire employees, the income is there, but they simply do not have the housing stock there. We make some reforms to that program so we can actually jumpstart the workforce housing component in some rural communities. And uh, we're excited about that. It's a great bill and it's one that I'm looking forward to presenting today. Uh, moving into conference committee and working with Senator Miller as well as Governor Dayton and his commissioners and getting a good bill passed into law. So thank you. I'm going to take questions now. No, we'll, 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 we'll Sarah. Next, we have uh, Chair Sarah Anderson uh, with the government operation, or excuse me, the, the state government finance uh, budget bill. Uh, thank you. I was waiting for Pat to say Teef River in honor of Dan <laughs> Fabian, but didn't get that. Um, so I'm in charge of the state government finance committee, and we have several provisions in the bill that prioritize our veterans for number one. So we have the veterans affairs and the military affairs as part of our budget. And some of the things that we're doing is we heard from constituents and the citizens across the state of Minnesota concerned about housing for veterans once they return home from active duty. So we have a provision in here that helps folks get the housing that they need and uh, put those homeless vets into homes that they uh, can utilize and get themselves back on their feet. We also heard from uh, citizens a uh, concern about veterans that are suffering from post-traumatic syndrome. Um, that are going through the court system and the court's not quite understanding or recognizing that that's part of the problem. So we're providing some training to the court so they recognize that and uh, can help hopefully get these folks back on their feet and uh, productive citizens for the state of Minnesota. We also extend the, extend the benefits uh, for the GI Bill. This is a provision of the governors that we've included as part of our legislation and excited about that. But not only that, we have some other provisions that just help out general Minnesotans. We have in the bill a Chair David's uh, bill on first-time home buyers, setting up an account so that we can encourage a home ownership. Uh, that's the American dream for everybody, so that's part of this legislation. Uh, and we also protect funding for uh, victims of uh, sexual violence and abuse as part of this, and we protect funding for those that suffer from disabilities. So that's kind of the big highlights from this. But we also do some good reform and accountability measures as part of this legislation. So when we're looking at overall of state government, we have some pieces of uh, legislation here that I think uh, Representative Nash will speak a little bit more on the gain sharing piece. Uh, we found in state government that they um, were not using the program as it was originally intended. We said you're supposed to give out rewards to state employees upon achieving a, a 
state savings that hasn't been happening, and Representative Nash can speak to that. We're going to get that cleaned up. We also clean up the whole issue of severance packages. You guys all heard last fall where the governor's office was using severance packages to basically um, uh, pay off cronies. There was one individual that had only been in public office for six months and received a payout of $18,000. So we end that, we clean it up, and we make sure that that's not going to happen at any time in the future. Uh, and then we also have an accountability piece when it comes to looking at how we operate in our audits for our county governments. So we put that in place too. And then just overall, we have some great savings. Um, currently, we um, don't allow for employees of state government to opt out if, for example, they have health insurance through something else. And we are saving the state $3.4 million by allowing them to use other insurance rather than relying on the state insurance. This is a great reform um, carried by Representative Draskowski with a cost savings of $3.4 million. We also have Representative Nash's bill on full consolidation of our IT, and that's a cost savings to the state of $3 million. And then overall, we're trying to get our hands around government growth. And so we're capping the growth of government to make it lean, smart, uh, and efficient for the taxpayers of Minnesota. So that's it in a nutshell. And I don't know if uh, Representative Nash, you want to speak a little bit more to the gain sharing piece. Sure. Well, thank you, Chair Anderson. Good, uh, good morning or afternoon. You know, uh, we, we did uncover some things about the gain sharing program, and uh, the story came out yesterday. It's very interesting. You know, the, the piece of legislation was passed several years ago before I got here to create this opportunity for employees if they found some savings, and it was measurable, and the post ten, uh, past tense measured uh, that they could then receive an award. Well, we haven't been able to find any savings, and when we asked both Commissioner Franz and several other folks uh, in MMB to point to the savings that they were able to find, they couldn't. And you know, I, I made a joke in committee, and maybe yesterday in the story as well, from, uh, from a certain movie to show us the money, and, and that's what we asked for. Please show us the money that you saved, and they couldn't find any. So we're going to take some measures to provide accountability to the taxpayers of Minnesota that the money that has been paid out, now $6.7 million, that has been paid out, that their money that you pay in as taxpayers is actually deriving some savings. Well, by doing simple math of 10% should have been uh, taken out of this to, to provide the savings, that means $67 million should have been saved. It wasn't. Um, so we're taking a very close and hard look at that. And I think that as, uh, as taxpayers, we should all be very, very uh, concerned when, in my opinion, the sort of abuse that we see here is, is going on. Uh, OLA, uh, the Auditor Nobles is going to be taking a look at this, so I think it's not just, just me or Chair Anderson thinking that this is a very important issue. Uh, apparently so does the Legislative Auditor. That we can take questions. Um, Chair Anderson, what is, the, what is the actual cap number that's, that as this bill comes to the floor? Uh, sure, it is 31,691. And just to kind of put that in perspective for you, currently uh, state government is just a little over 32,000. And we were asking that the state go back to the levels of FTEs to about between 2013 and 2014. So just, you know, about three and a half years ago, we're asking government to uh, do that. We allow for the commissioner of MMB to utilize early retirement um, and uh, other forms of attrition so that we can minimize uh, the disruption or anything that might be caused by it. But this is, I think, a good step in the right direction. What we've seen over the last several years is a huge growth in government overall. Um, it's uh, over a thousand folks that have been added. Um, and I think a lot of times when people look at this budget surplus in particular, nobody is clamoring that we spend it on growing government. They are looking for the relief in taxes. They're looking for um, things for their schools and things of that nature. So that's what we're trying to focus and emphasize things on. Representative, guess, this could be interpreted as an across the board, which is something that the governor has said no to, uh, would you, in what case would you make to him that he shouldn't veto it on a, as a result of that? I think he was pretty strong on that aspect of it. Well, I encourage the governor to work with us uh, on all of these issues. I think it is uh, premature and unfortunate to say that you're just going to veto something out of hand without having a conversation. And I would welcome the opportunity to discuss this issue with him. And I would ask that that be a courtesy to extend it to all of us in the legislature. Um, we have, uh, you know, 134 members in the House, 67 set, uh, senators. Um, we all represent the state of Minnesota. And I will tell you, uh, by and large, 
Minnesotans are not looking for the surplus to be spent on growing government. They are looking for it to be a relief to them, to their communities, and I think that's what our budget is overall. Representative Garofalo, there are hundreds of people upstairs uh, outside the House chamber protesting the Enbridge pipeline. They say you have an amendment today. Uh, is that true, and what is it, does it allow the pipeline to be built? Yeah, so Pat, uh, back in 2014, a pipeline permit application was submitted to replace the Line 3 pipeline. Uh, this is an old pipeline that was built in the 1960s. Uh, the owners of the pipeline, Enbridge, have voluntarily reduced the pressure in it because of concerns of how old it is. Uh, the federal government has entered into a consent, consent decree with Enbridge to build a replacement pipeline. So those, are, those things are not in dispute. It's been two and a half years. It's been two and a half years on a multi-billion dollar private infrastructure project. And the environmental extremists who are using the regulatory process to delay decision making on this are hurting Minnesota. They're hurting the economy. They're putting the environment at risk. And worst of all, they're delaying needed and improvements to our economy in greater Minnesota. I want to say this again. This is $2.1 billion dollars of private sector in place, uh, infrastructure to replace an aging pipeline that is more at risk. And so the opposition to this is mindless, it is fact free, and it's led by a bunch of science deniers. Period. So what does this amendment do? Does it allow the construction? Does it remove barriers? What, what, what does it do? The unprecedented delay we've seen from the regulatory agencies and the Public Utilities Commission, there's, there, we've never seen anything like this in the state of Minnesota. It's been two and a half years. We make it real simple and we make it really, real direct that we're not going to let them do to line three what they did to the Sandpiper pipeline. The certificate of need and the route permit will be approved with this legislation, period. And Chair Garofalo, uh, earlier this morning, uh, uh, Representative Wagenius said the bill would sabotage the solar industry. She said 495 jobs related to solar energy would go away if this became law. What's your response to that? Well, the, as everyone knows, the Made in Minnesota solar program is an embarrassment. Uh, it costs $15 million a year to, to create very little energy. What we're proposing to do is repurpose that money in a way that saves ratepayers money and reduces far more pollution. How would it do that? Uh, a couple of projects. Number one, there's an innovative project up in Duluth, a once-in-a-hundred-year plan where they're going to be ripping up the streets there and redoing their steam plant up there. So right now, they basically take the heat that they provide from their steam and dump it back into Lake Superior. This is going to recapture that and double the efficiency of that program in Duluth. In addition, the generators on the Lake Billsby Dam down in southern Dakota County, they're over 100 years old. This is going to provide a matching grant to upgrade those, gener those generators to produce far more clean energy at a far reduced price. Representative, getting back to uh, Pat's question about the pipeline and your amendment there, is essentially, does the, does the amendment go around the Public Utilities Commission? And, and if it does, is, is that legal? Uh, number one, it's legal because um, what their duties are prescribed are in law. The Public Utilities Commission for over two years has been breaking the law. In concert with the Department of Commerce, they've been breaking the law. The MinCan pipeline, the entire regulatory process was completed in 16 months. Make no mistake about it, the objections to this have nothing to do with policy or economy. This is, this is pure politics. This, these are environmental extremists who are jeopardizing the economy and jeopardizing public safety in our heavy, heavily populated areas. And quite, san, uh, quite candidly, a majority of the legislature on a bipartisan basis is sick of this. But the, are you doing an end round around the PUC by just changing the rules here and that they are applying? Pat, they're not enforcing, they're not following the law, they're not following the guidelines. It's been two and a half years. And it, the guidelines it, it, say it should have been done in a year or? I mean, this, the original application had this, had this pipeline in service. And I have to emphasize this. This is not a new pipeline. It's replacing an existing aging pipeline that the federal government has ordered us, has ordered Enbridge as soon as possible replace. So as we've seen with other uh, key pipeline infrastructure projects, the opposition to this has far more to do with environmental groups fundraising. It has nothing to do with jobs, the economy, or the environment. 
the group we heard from earlier was calling on Governor Dayton to veto a bill that would contain these en Enbridge items. Is that something you're preparing for? And if so, um, what would kind of be your next plan after that? Governor Dayton has stated both publicly and privately that he supports the Line 3 replacement project as well as the Sandpiper Pipeline project. Could he um, kill the Sandpiper project? <laughs> The, uh, this is the original language of the bill also contained um, removal of the certificate, certificate of need process for pipelines with that applied to all pipelines. Right. The purpose of a certificate of need is so that, let's say, for example, a utility that uh, an investor-owned utility wants to build a new, po uh, new power lines or a new generation. Because they have what is essentially an institutionalized monopoly, there has to be consumer protections to make sure they don't overbuild that infrastructure. They don't build power plants they don't need. That's simply not the case with pipelines. A certificate of need to determine whether the private sector needs a pipeline is irrelevant. It's 100% privately financed. If it's not needed, the investors are going to lose money, not the ratepayers. What are the other checks, then? The, the other environmental checks available to the PUC or to the state for, for pipeline construction? There? Well, there's an entire route permitting process. OK, and that would still be a place then. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, uh, Senator. Senate Majority Leader, whose name just escaped my head. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Has oh, did you forget my name? When oh. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Only when I'm talking to Senator Gazelka. Okay. Um, uh, has said repeatedly that he does not want to send a batch of budget bills to the governor and have them vetoed. He would rather negotiate them after the break, and his goal is to get the targets as the governor, the joint targets for everyone by the end of April. Is that your goal, too, or do you have a different goal? Absolutely, and we've been consistent uh, since the beginning of session saying that we were going to move our deadlines forward uh, to allow more time at the end of session, that we wanted a transparent process. I know that the governor feels like he has an advantage if he can push everything right to the brink at the end of session and force everybody into these last-minute uh, passing of bills. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I think Minnesotans deserve a much more open and transparent process. So we've decided to push the deadlines earlier. Uh, we're going to invite the governor and his commissioners into conference committee, just as we have in, in our regular committees as we're passing bills. Um, and we want the decisions to be made there in a transparent place where the public can actually have some input in the process. Um, it was uh, discouraging yesterday to hear uh, the governor's top commissioner uh, stating that uh, he's recommending that the governor veto bills that we haven't even passed yet. Um, to me, those are words that, that are designed to set things up for a shutdown. And, and I really hope the governor's not planning for a shutdown or trying to force us into a shutdown. Um, I hope he'll you know, participate in the transparent process that we're inviting him to participate in to, to, to settle the disagreements that might exist on these bills. And I want to remind folks that I think if you look at our budget bills versus the governor's proposed budget, we probably agree on 90% of, of, of state spending. Uh, certainly north of 80%, okay? So we're only talking about, you know, 10 or 20, might even be less than that percent of, of where the rest of the resources get spent or how they get distributed. And, and um, with a $1.65 billion surplus, I see no reason why we can't, uh, you know, come to an agreement and, and work out our differences and, and solve uh, the state's budget in a way that represents the priorities that I think we all care about um, and that Minnesotans care about. Is your, goal, is your goal joint targets for everyone by the end of April? Okay. Well, I, I, I would like to do that. Um, I don't know uh, how realistic that is. I think we could even do it you know, a week or so later. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to allow the governor to push us to the end like he has done in the past. See, re remember that the governor is the only one who can call a special session. And, and he feels like he has leverage if he can force us into that. Or if we feel like we don't want a special session, um, if he pushes us right to the brink with the threat of special session, um, that would give him leverage over us. I'm sorry. Minnesotans deserve better than that. And, and I'm not going to participate in that sort of uh, brinksmanship like they, uh, like they tried to force us into the last couple of years. And, and frankly, if you remember two years ago in the budget, uh, ultimately Senator Bach and I had to, uh, in the governor's own home, uh, come to an agreement without him in the room. Um, because it didn't seem like the governor was able to get to that final uh, decision. And, and uh, he did end up vetoing three of the bills, uh, but we were able to work that out and, and pass those fairly quickly. So last year when you passed your bonding bill on the last night of session with very few minutes left, that was the governor's fault? Nope. So how did the governor push you to the brink? I, no, I couldn't get, I, in that case, it was Senator Bach that was pushing us to the brink. I couldn't get him to even agree to a number until 7 p.m. on the last night of session. That's unfortunate. 
Uh, but remember that, that Democrats also took that bill down um, to put Southwest Light Rail in. So it's, it's always you know, inserting these highly controversial projects that just don't frankly make sense um, and don't have broad support uh, to try to hold other things hostage. I don't think the legislature or, or you know, the, the governor should be, should be holding Minnesotans hostage to fund schools and roads and bridges and all of these things that Minnesotans see as so very important. The governor has said you know, that he supports tax relief for Minnesotans, but yet he vetoed the most bipartisan, broadly supported tax bill ever vetoed by a governor last year. Um, you know, Representative Garofalo mentioned the Sandpiper Pipeline and how the governor has repeatedly said that he supported the Sandpiper Pipeline, but then did everything he could to kill it. And what did it cost for Minnesota's economy? It cost us 2,000 jobs. And did they stop an, an ounce of oil from coming out of the ground in North Dakota? No. In fact, they're building a pipeline directly around the state of Minnesota, and we lost the jobs and the, the, the local property tax revenue that would have been accumulated by having that line run, run across our state. And, you know, I think I have the largest pipeline that runs right through the middle of my district. And my guess is that 90% of the people in my district have no clue it's even there. Uh, and, and it's the, the, the pipeline that comes from Canada and, and brings crude oil to the, to the refinery uh, south of the Twin Cities. So, um, you know, we, what we need is we need a governor to participate in an open, transparent process to work out our differences in a way that, that represents the priorities of, of Minnesotans. Um, and, and we're inviting him to do that. If he chooses not to and wants to run us up using brinksmanship to the to the end, I, I don't think it's going to work out beneficial for him. I really don't. Well, Mr. Speaker, if, if you pass the bills earlier than usual, conference reports I'm talking about, yeah. send them to the governor, the governor vetoes it because they're not exactly the way he wants, then you're right back where you were, aren't you, unless you guys adjourn well, sine die, and my hope is got some leverage over him, right? My hope is that we've left more time at the end. If he does choose to veto our common sense bills, you know, fine. But, and we're, we'll certainly negotiate with him if he chooses to do that. But I'm not going to play a phony negotiating game or pretend like we're talking to each other when we're really not um, in, in an effort to try to drag things out to get us to the end of session. Um, I think Minnesotans deserve a, a good debate, and I think they can handle it. Even when we disagree, Minnesotans can handle a, a good debate on issues because what we'd be talking about is what we should, we should all support as priorities to help Minnesotans. That's, those are good things. Um, instead, the governor wants to talk already. I mean, what do we have, seven weeks left, and he's talking about vetoing bills that we haven't even passed yet. Um, my guess is he'd, he'd certainly want to work with us in the conference committee process to work out the differences so that nobody has to veto any bills. Um, that's, that's what we're inviting him to do. I hope, I hope he'll take us up on our invitation. The governor's office says, it has a real concern, says the governor has concerns about the state government bill in particular because it, they say that they prepare for, it prepares for a shutdown. Is, is that true? Does it, uh, does it keep government the, going? The state government finance... Shuts down. The, the state government finance bill does have a provision, which, by the way, was brought by a Democrat chief author. Um, and you know what? We'll, we'll take ideas, even if a Democrat brings them forward. We're not partisan people. Uh, we want the best ideas to come forward. And a Democrat brought a bill forward that would have prevented a, a, or, or allowed government to continue to operate in the event of a shutdown, and we put it in the bill. Um, my hope is that that's not Democrats kind of foreshadowing that they want a shutdown. Um, no, we don't believe so at all. We don't believe so at all. And in fact, many other states have provisions in their uh, state law that would prevent a government shutdown in the event that there is not an agreement on, uh, on budget bills at the end of a session. Chair Garofalo, quick question about the gas tax marking on the gas pump part of the bill. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Right. So just to be clear, my bill does not raise the gas tax, just to make it very clear. Um, what this does is there's a lot of questions about what the price of gasoline, how much of it's government. So what this is going to do when the Department of Weights and Measures goes around and affixes their stickers verifying that the proper quantities are being given, there'll be a label on there denoting how much of it is a federal gas tax and how much is state gas tax. So when people are purchasing gasoline, they're going to have an idea of how much government is taking from that. Is that intended to elevate gas tax angst? Get people more angry about gas taxes? No. Uh, it's more just to have transparency in pricing so people understand what role government uh, plays in the, the cost of the energy they're buying. Well, the, what the, the, uh, the sticker also say that the revenue all goes to roads and bridges? Uh, no, because that's not the case with the federal gas tax. 
Um, I do think, though, that you're going to start seeing more businesses doing this, particularly in the liquor industry and other areas where uh, people are price sensitive. They're going to be wanting to disclose how much of that is coming from uh, the cost of government. One of the uh, bedrock principles of, of Republican economic policy is we don't pick winners and losers. Um, so how do you square that with support for DigiKey and the uh, trash to ethanol plant and so forth? Well, these to, be types clear, of programs? to be clear, the, the trash, uh, the waste to energy program in Invergrove Heights, the only reason the government is involved is because instead of using groundwater, they're going to use the wastewater from the Empire Township um, sewer plant. So that's the only involvement we have in that is that right now there's sort of an incentive to use new groundwater and the state is involved to say, hey, this is a, this is a better, smarter way to supply water is by using wastewater as opposed to fresh water. There's no appropriation? Is there money? Yes, but it's to pay for the pipeline. It's to pay for, it's to pay for an extension of the wastewater pipeline from the, the sewage plant over to this location. So that way we're using it for that as opposed to using groundwater which I think most people would view not as a business incentive, but would rather just, it's a smart government, right? I mean, why use something new when you can use, we can use wastewater? Uh, with regards to DigiKey, DigiKey is a, in a very highly competitive environment. It's a regional player in our economy. And uh, it's something that we're requiring, you know, we're talking tens of millions of dollars of private sector investment on the front side. Uh, the Minnesota Investment Fund is specifically set up for these sorts of purposes. And so it's an exciting project, and it's one that's going to help solidify economic activity in northwestern Minnesota, not just for years, but for decades to come. One more. A question for the leader, sir. Are you going to file a protest against uh, um, Melissa Horstman? Uh, yes, we're going to file a protest and dissent letter probably tomorrow, and in relation to the inappropriate comments she made earlier this week. What are you protesting? Well, I mean, if you listen to her comments, she talked about white males, and we just think it's inappropriate to single out a group and a gender of people on the House floor. It's just, it's not what we do in the House. It's not our custom and usage. It um, doesn't set a positive tone. And anger, and members are very angry by it. Are, are you, uh, she said this morning she regrets her comments. Uh, are you guys going to get together at all and talk about this? We've talked about it a little bit. I mean, she'd been asked a couple times to apologize to members, and I don't know that that's happened. Um, there's a lot of hard feelings about it, about the incident that took place. Does the protest and dissent letter, does it, is there any force beyond just filing that? Is this censure being talked about or any other sort of discipline or reprimand? No, it'll just be filed in the, the journal to, to point out that we're not happy with what transpired and that that's not the direction that the legislature should be doing as leaders as, of the state. Do you believe that anything more uh, serious than that is appropriate under the circumstances? I, I don't, but I, I still wish that she would apologize, and I hope she has time to consider the th comments that she made and, um, you know, how offensive they were, and, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But for now, we're just going to do the, the letter and put have that on file. Mm -hmm.